Populism and democracy have a complicated history, and in the past few years, the ballot box in several Western democratic countries has become the focal point for a kind of mass discontent that can quickly turn previously untested voices into leaders with real power. That has some very concerned about what might happen to human rights around the world. Among them is Farida Deef. She is Canada Director for Human Rights Watch, and we're pleased to welcome her here to TVO for more. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I don't Thank know how you. it is possible. I haven't met you yet over all the years that <laughs> you've been doing what you've been doing and I've been doing what I've been doing, but sure. good to have you here. Thank you. Populism has taken a real hold over much of the public in places where we may have least expected it. And I want to get your theory as to why you think that's happened. Well, I mean, I think there's a number of things. Populism is, is, is very attractive to many people because there's complex problems in the world today. Societies are becoming increasingly diverse. There's more immigration, migration into countries. There's economic downturns that have resulted in people being alienated from the global economy. There are issues in terms of threats to security. Terrorism is much more, something that's much more, much more visible these days. And populists are very skilled in tapping into those types of fears and anxieties of an alienated group of people and saying, well, I have a very simple solution. I have a simple reason for this, the cause for your problems, and I have a simple solution for them. And so it's a complicated world, but populists will often say, well, we understand the will of the majority. We embody the will of the majority. Um, it's sort of a style of politics where people feel that they can alienate minorities, they can scapegoat certain groups of people who might be un unpopular right now and say that those are the cause. That's the reason for society's problems. So we have co a complex world and the cause of that for many populist leaders, the reason why there are problems is the immigrant, is the migrant, is the Muslim, is the Mexican, the undocumented mm -hmm. worker. They're the cause of your problems is what they argue. And the solution is quite simple as well from their perspective. In your experience, is the solution ever as simple as portrayed? No. Certainly, I mean, there are issues with economic downturns in the global economy and issues in terms of technological advances that might mean that certain people are not reaping the benefits of globalization. But the cause of that is not the immigrant. And the solution of, for that is not immigration bans, is not deportations, is not building walls. Um, there's a much more complicated set of issues here. I hear you, but, but clearly the people who make the rules, you know, there's a huge chunk of people in North American society, well, go to Western Europe, go all over the world, who think that the fix is in against them and that the people who've been making the rules have essentially been doing it to keep them up and to keep the others down, the people that you're referring to right here. Uh, that's a fair observation, isn't it? You know what, I think populists play into that a lot. What they do is they say that, in fact, we are anti-establishment. Populism often, there's often a, a very unconventional leader, sometimes charismatic leader that's, that's a part of these movements. And they say, well, you know, we understand the, the plight of the ordinary person. We are anti-establishment, we're anti-elite. And they provide very false promises to them. They say, we're gonna, you know, bring back factories. We're going to, you know, we're gonna be able to bring back jobs. We're going to really be able to stop the tide of globalization by really finding really kind of undermining the rights of others, undermining the rights of migrants in particular, undermining the rights of Muslims. And we've seen this across the board. And the worrying trend is really what's happening in, in, in certainly Western Europe and the United States right now, where populism is really kind of gaining force. And the idea that populists will often argue is that you can violate people's human rights as long as it's a popular idea. Well, you can you could make two separate arguments there. Let's, let's take one of them aside, the whole issue about the other the immigrant, the refugee, that's one thing. But you you also put into that equation that you just put forward the notion of saving jobs or creating jobs uh, by reopening the factory. I mean, Donald Trump has, listen, we're, we're talking about Trump here, basically. I mean, let's read between the lines. Donald Trump has received a lot of plaudits for saving jobs in Indiana, for saving jobs in other locations as well by, uh, if you like, using the power of his Twitter feed to shame American executives into keeping jobs here. Who's gonna, eh, not here, but there. Who's going to complain about that? Well, I think you're not really getting to the, the, the deep-rooted issue is that there are, you know, people are being left behind by the global economy because of technological advances oftentimes, mm -hmm. um, because of low-skilled, cheap labor in other countries. So there's a number of issues there that are at play. 
But the answers that are being provided by these populist leaders are really kind of cheap answers. They're not really getting to the deep causes and the roots of the problem. Um, they're not training people on the skills that are needed for today's workforce, for today's jobs. They're looking and saying, well, the reason I don't have a job is because of the immigrant, because of the migrant. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a really dangerous way to behave. That's a really dangerous thing when political leaders are promoting discrimination, promoting prejudice and racism, because that has very serious ramifications on others. Well, here's Kenneth Roth, executive director of your very organization, who uh, says the following. In its early years, the modern human rights movement was preoccupied with the atrocities of World War II and the repression associated with the Cold War. Having seen the evil that governments can do, states adopted a series of human rights treaties to limit and deter future abuse. Protecting these rights was understood as necessary for individuals to live in dignity. Growing respect for rights laid the foundation for freer, safer, and more prosperous societies. But today, a growing number of people have come to see rights as not protecting them from the state, but as undermining governmental efforts to defend them. How did that happen? Well, I think what some populist leaders um, in France, we look at Marine Le Pen, we look at Gert Wilders in the Netherlands, um, we look at President Bush in the United States. What they've Bush, been, Trump. Oh, sorry, President Trump, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, in the United States. What you see is leaders who are um, really kind of inconvenienced by the rule of law, by good governance, by human rights values. These are inconveniences for them. What they want to do is say, well, we've tapped into the will of the majority, and the majority wants this or that discriminatory policy or law or regulation. It's not even and true, actually. I mean, Trump got three million fewer votes than Clinton, right? So it's not even the will of the majority. No, but not even in terms of the vote, but more in terms of them saying, well, I've tapped into the will of the majority. The majority of the population wants this or that, not even through the election, but just through just their own kind of polling. Mm. Um, and a popular idea doesn't make it right, right? I mean, you might, you know, torture might be popular. For many people, people might, you know, the majority of Americans might feel that torture um, is the way to really collect information and evidence from terrorist suspects. That is the right way to go. That doesn't mean it's right, that it still makes it a human rights violation. The majority or a number of Canadians might feel that we should, you know, um, reinstate the death penalty. That doesn't make it right. Um, and so what they peddle in populist leaders is the idea that popularity of a, a proposal or an idea makes it right. And that's where the problem is. So play that forward for us. What kind of damage do you believe populist rhetoric can do to human rights? Well, I think it erodes the human rights values, right? It erodes the foundation of, of the human rights system. So when you have leaders in the West who say that, well, in fact, you know, we, you know, as President um, Trump has said um, over the course of his campaign and, and more recently now, that um, we're thinking of, you know, returning enhanced interrogation techniques, a form of torture. Um, we're thinking of reinstating and opening the secret CIA prison program. What that does is it gives the green light for every other dictator and, or every other, you know, government leader in every country to violate the rights of their unpopular minorities. So every country might have, you know, an unpopular minority at that time, but what happens is that you, you give the green light and you give them license to dis discriminate against those individuals. Tr Trump's argument is they're doing it anyway, so why shouldn't we? Well, yeah, but, but that's a And our example won't make a difference to them. Well, it does. That's it, his argument. It does make a difference. I mean, I think it, you know, having moral authority in the world does make a difference in terms of being able to prevent human rights violations from happening in other countries, or at least attempt to have it. There is a situation now where there's very little moral, moral authority that the U.S. government has to um, look at sort of torture issues in other countries, to address issues in the criminal justice system or rule of law in other countries. And so, you know, the unpopular minority right now, certainly in America, the unpopular group of people are migrants, Mexicans, Muslims. And, you know, in other countries that um, now, you know, have license to discriminate against, it might be another unpopular minority. It might be Roma in certain countries. Mm -hmm. It might be individuals who are, um, you know, drug addicts who the president of the Philippines wants to eradicate. Uh, it might be dissidents in terms of judges and journalists in Turkey. So it really does have a ripple effect. The harm that's inflicted by populist leaders isn't contained in their country. It really does reverberate around the world. Why don't you take Trump at his word when he says, if we really wanted this to be a Muslim ban, there are 45 countries around the world that have significant Muslim populations, and there's only seven of them that are on my list. So clearly, he would argue, 
This is not about Muslims. It's about terrorists. That's his view. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's been disproved because, you know, in many ways that the seven countries that have been, the Muslim majority countries that were banned as part of this executive order, um, none of which had, none of these countries, nationals, had committed any terrorist attacks against the United States. And so that argument is, is, is really invalid. But it is, a, it is clearly a ban that's targeting Muslims. We know the campaign rhetoric, that, that rhetoric that occurred during his campaign, which was talking about a blanket Muslim ban. That was sort of toned down over the course of his, the beginning of his presidency, and now to kind of focus on these seven majority countries, seven Muslim majority countries. Um, the more harmful element of the ban, in fact, is, is really kind of freezing the refugee program in the United States and closing indefinitely the Syrian refugee program. So in the height of a refugee, Refugee, a global refugee crisis, to block the door and sort of shut the door on refugees is something that is not only incredibly harmful and cruel, but can be really right life-threatening for so many refugees and migrants. And the majority favors it. Well, exactly. I yeah. mean, that's the that that is the problem. That it is a, an idea might be popular, but it doesn't make it right. I'd like you to gauge our political leaders in terms of the kind of populist rhetoric you may or may not hear coming from politicians in this country. Uh, who are you hearing and what do you like or not like? Well, I mean, I think that there are, you know, populist sort of style tactics that are being used. I'm not sure if I would call, you know, um, which politicians I would call necessarily populist in this country, but they're, they're using the same sort of tools and tactics. You want to name names? Um, <laughs> Well, you know, certainly during the, in the conservative leadership, um, you know, Kelly Leach has mentioned, has used the sort of tactic of, you know, two-thirds of Canadians want a screening, a value screening test on would-be migrants. And saying, well, one, assuming that that poll is accurate, which, you know, who knows, but two, assuming that that makes it right, because that's what the majority wants. Um, so that's problematic, but I think more... Importantly, I mean, you look at the spectrum of policies that have been put in place in, um, you know, particularly I think in Quebec, I think that there is, there's certain issues there with, with, with xenophobia, with anti-Muslim sentiment. It's not unique to Quebec, it, it's, but there is, you know, a number of policies that have been put in place lately by politicians that sort of really feed into a kind of anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant sentiment. So, you know, policies in terms of um, a code of conduct for um, migrants in small rural, a small rural town in Quebec, a ban on um, Muslim women from wearing a veil if they are working in public institutions, or a proposal that was pushed forward earlier in the year um, by a liberal um, Quebec um, politician f uh, to basically deny women who cover their face with the Muslim niqab from any public service, from the right, from you know, the access to education, well. access to health care, access to employment. And the problem here is that there's, what they're saying is, well, you know, one, these laws, these rules are popular. We have a population that is uncomfortable by the rise of a particular religious minority, by the visibility of a religious minority. And because we're uncomfortable by that, we're willing to violate those individuals' rights. Well, you know, it goes beyond that as well, of course. I mean, the, the French fact in, in North America is basically, I mean, it's overwhelmingly centered in the province of Quebec, and they have for uh, only about 350 years felt that unless they do above and beyond, uh, they're going to be vulnerable to extinction. They don't want to end up like um, the French in New Orleans, for example. But having said that, well, maybe I should just play the clip here. Philippe Couillard, the Premier of Quebec, after the horrifying events of Quebec City recently, um, had this to say. Sheldon, roll the clip, please. When I say that words matter, it means that words can hurt. Words can be knives slashing at people's conscience. And we have to be more cognizant of this. What we say here and elsewhere is not trivial. Okay, I certainly would not deny anything that you just said, but on the other hand, Justin Trudeau, Philippe Couillard, numerous other political leaders in the province of Quebec have come forward and, you know, really, I would presume you think, fought the good fight for tolerance and openness and respect and, and so on after the Quebec City shooting. I mean, that's fair to say, isn't it? Yeah, no, it is fair to say, and I, I, fair to say, and I, I, I think it's really important not to um, directly attribute words and actions to the motivations of the shooter. I don't know the motivations of the shooter. Um, certainly there's information that's um, public in the media about their sort of politically right-leaning tendencies. That's one thing. But, you know, 
that aside, in terms of the motives of the, you know, the individual shooter, I think what's important, and, and I think this is a sort of you know, introspection that's happening right now, a sort of self-reflection in Quebec, is um, are the words of politicians, um, are political leaders in Quebec um, promoting prejudice and discrimination in any way? And you know, the hallmark of any democratic society is freedom of expression. That's true. Mm -hmm. um, and that is not something that I would, we would ever contest. But public officials and public leaders have a particular obligation and responsibility Agreed. not to be promoting any kind of discrimination. But who have you seen in the or... last two weeks doing that? What Quebec politicians have been promoting prejudice in the last couple of weeks? If anything, we've seen the opposite. No, I mean, it's not been over the past couple of weeks, but I think you have to look at this within a much longer time frame. Okay. And the proposals that I was mentioning before in terms of the code of conduct for migrants, in terms of the, um, you know, the um, veil, the ban on the veil, in terms of, you know, denying women public services, these are all sort of, you know, loosely veiled attempts to be discriminatory against a certain population. Um, and your discomfort, and I think one of the interesting things as we look at these bans that have occurred, you know, or proposals in Quebec, the same bans have actually been, have passed in several European countries mm -hmm. um, against Muslim women uh, in public institutions, et cetera. France, the Burkini. In, exactly. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I thought was very interesting was the European Court of Human Rights, um, which upheld the ban. Um, in its dissenting opinions said, you know, your discomfort, a society might be uncomfortable by the way a certain person dresses, by a certain, uh, by a way that someone chooses to express themselves religiously. Um, you may be uncomfortable that someone has tattoos on their face and, and ear piercings. Um, you might be uncomfortable that a woman is wearing a niqab, but your discomfort is not more important than someone's fundamental human rights. It's not more important than someone's right to religious expression, than mm -hmm. someone's right to access to education, access to healthcare. It's not more important. My hunch is, well, I don't even know, I should ask. My hunch is, though, that a lot of the people associated with Human Rights Watch are not particularly religious people, and yet you're prepared to go to the mat for religious rights for people across the country. Is that fair to say? I mean, I think it's fair to say that we would, we're, we look at sort of religious expression as a really fundamental human right. Mm. And so, um, and the right to non-discrimination, again, is another fundamental human right that people should have. And that's mm. across the board. And in the same way that we protect atheists who, in, in countries that are uh, much more religious in terms of their ability to say that they are atheists, the ability to write, you know, atheist-leaning um, articles, in the same way we would, we would protect individuals' right to freedom of expression on a more religious framework. Let's talk trade for a second, because you talked earlier about how sometimes our Western values can, um, well, the rest of the world will not look credibly at upholding some of these values if we don't follow them ourselves. And, you know, it wasn't that long ago that the Justin Trudeau government was trying to do a deal on arms with Saudi Arabia, saying that they couldn't break a contract because the previous government had signed it and a contract is a contract. Do you believe it affects our credibility on human rights when we do trade deals with autocratic regimes around the world? I think it absolutely does. I and are you prepared to put 3,000 people out of work in London, Ontario, who build those armaments in order to stand up for your principles? Yes. You I mean, want... I think uh, with the Saudi arms deal, I think one of the things that's really important to know is that um, recognizing that it is a huge arms deal, it's a huge economic boon potentially to London, Ontario, and to the trade and manufacturing there. But it is also a very huge potential and current stain on the human rights record of this government that generally is very, you know, positive, you know, in terms of human rights principles, in terms of inclusion, in terms of an approach to the world. And so if those types of armaments that are manufactured, these light armored vehicles that are manufactured in London, Ontario, then are taken by the Saudi government and enter civilian areas in Yemen and cause um, civilian casualties that we've seen happen again and again by the Saudi-led coalition, then it's not only going to be a stain on the human rights reputation of Canada, but it's going to be a serious issue that needs to be inquired on and investigated in terms of whether Canadian-made armaments are really you know, aiding human rights crimes to occur, war crimes to occur. And so I think, in a sense, yes, there's a trade element. Of course, there's a trade argument. But I think we can't have a really myopic focus on trade when we talk about foreign policy. And Human Rights Watch makes decisions about where, which countries should be, should have an arms embargo really seriously. And it's only a handful of countries that we would call for an arms embargo. And Saudi Arabia is one of them. Given the level of, of human rights abuses and war crimes violations that we've documented 
by the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen, and also in terms of the repression and dissent that we've documented for many years inside Saudi Arabia. And so it's a very, um, it's a very dangerous game that, we're, that the Canadian government is playing by assuming that reassurances from the Saudi government that these armaments, these light armored vehicles, will not enter Yemen or will not be used to, to repress you know, internally the population to actually you know, believe those you know, reassurances is really problematic. And I think what we're seeing in the UK right now, what we're seeing in the US in terms of you know, reviews, parliamentary reviews, et cetera, of the, their kind of arms deals show the kinds of complications that result with these types of dubious arms deals. I hear you, but do you see the other side of the argument, which is, OK, so we don't sell them the armaments. Somebody else sells them the armaments. Somebody else's population, therefore, has the job. Somebody else's government gets the taxes and gets rich. We've lost the jobs. Those people in London, Ontario are unemployed. And whatever malfeasance was going to happen with those arms, if the Saudis have them, is still going to happen. And maybe we get to say that our hands are clean over the whole thing. But look at the unemployment. Look at the misery we've created in our own backyard. Are you sympathetic at all to that argument? I mean, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the argument of the, the you know, of the need for certain economic stimulus packages in certain parts of, the, of Canada, for sure. I think that the answer can't, it's, the, an, an arms deal with a government that we know full well violates the human rights of individuals both in its country and through uh, and in other countries. That's a very, you know, it's, a, it's I, surely there are other arms deals or there's other deals or manufacturing deals that the Canadian government and, and, and others could be pushing forward with a different client, a different client that is not a, a, a very recognized human rights abuser because this is something that is really going to be a stain on the reputation of this government really for years to come. A stain among who? My hunch is not, a, not among the people in London, Ontario, who are going to be bloody thankful that this government went through with the deal and saved their jobs. So who's the stain? Who's going well, to... I think they're staying on their, on, their, on their international reputation. So right now, this government has a certain level of moral authority in a world that's really in a, a kind of vacuum in the world of moral authority. So we, we look at the Trudeau government, we look at the, the government of Angela Merkel in Germany, as voices of human rights and tolerance and moral authority in a world that's lacking it today. Um, it would be really disappointing for the government to kind of continue to push forward with a deal that really kind of you know, erodes their moral authority in the world. You understand I'm pushing back here because that's part of the job, not because I'm taking a position on the issue. Okay, I should yeah. just, you know, I want to clarify <laughs> that for everybody who's watching as well. Human rights organizations have long used the tool of naming and shaming countries that flout international law. But, you know, there's really quite an absence of shame in the world today. There are lots of international leaders who you just can't name and shame because they just don't feel any shame when you call them out. In fact, they might look at it as a badge of honor. So what do you do about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that that, that is a serious concern right now. And especially, I think, when you look at governments like the uh, Bashar al-Assad's government in Syria and others who are committing war crimes and a range of other um, humanitarian law violations in Syria, in their country, you know, they are somehow, you know, they're immune to shame. These governments mm. are really immune to shame. And so I think, you know, the human rights movement needs to be very strategic in terms of thinking about what levers, what kind of advocacy levers and pressure points do exist. Perhaps it's arms deals that can be suspended. Perhaps it's trade and infrastructure deals that can be suspended, um, loans from you know, big international financial institutions that can, also, that can be revoked or frozen from human rights uh, abusers, from perpetual and, syst and, and systematic human rights abusers. And so there's different levers that can be used, but I think you're right, the, the kind of general shame, there, there are governments that are shameless. And, and that's more and more today than ever. Well, let's look at one. Uh, and I'm not going to mention the name you all think I'm going to mention. Let's look at Duterte in the Philippines. This is a man who thinks nothing of killing thousands of people whom he claims are involved in the drug trade uh, or who may just be drug addicts or have a drug problem in the Philippines. He thinks nothing of killing them. What can Human Rights Watch do about that? Well, I think in, in the context of the Philippines in, in particular, when you're looking at um, a developing country, there are sometimes a little bit more pressure points that can be that can be put in play there. 
There are, you know, economic deals that, um, you know, governments should be stopping with, with the Philippines, the government of the Philippines. There are loans and other um, infrastructure projects from development organizations, from, you know, development agencies, foreign development agencies. Investment, foreign, you know, investment in the country should be, you know, frozen. There's, there's a lot of things like that and there's those types of levers that work particularly well, I think, in countries that need international assistance. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one last question? We have a minute to go here, and that is, do you ever get depressed at how much work you still have to do in this world? Yeah, I mean, I think there, it is depressing, but at the same time, I think there, what we've seen over the last few weeks is, you know, with, you know, Trump's um, executive order and the stay that, you know, was, was resulted in that migration order, one of the things that was actually quite inspiring and I think mobilizing and motivating for many people is that you had a situation where you had a very discriminatory executive order on migration refugees that was put forward by a new administration and people worked at really at all levels to stop it. You had people of all faiths, Americans and others of all faiths and backgrounds, protest at airports across the country. You had um, legal advocates and, and lawyers um, push forward cases, represent refugees and, and other migrants who were detained. Um, and then you had advocates who were working on the Hill with, with members of Congress and senators to, um, to pressure them to do something. And so, and in the end, you did have a stay on that. So How long that lasts? You know, in some respects, the worse it gets, the better for you guys, and the more we realize we need you. Is that the idea? Well, no, more that I think that there there is there is a lot of we can, that can be achieved if we work together. Hmm. If the public is more engaged and the public doesn't let the bar in terms of the human rights bar fall slow, you know, far, fall lower and lower. Hmm. And I think the danger of populists is often that you have the bar gets so low that the new normal becomes something that's really dangerous. And as long as the public and the legal community and the human rights community and the humanitarian community are working together to ensure that it isn't the new normal, that we are, we don't believe that, there, that, that individuals' rights should be violated, you know, regardless of the reason for it, I think that there is some progress that can be made. That's Farida Deef. She's the Canada Director at Human Rights Watch. Farida, great to meet you. Thanks for coming into TVO tonight. Thank you so much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.